Multi-green, building attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily real estate through impact investing. Welcome to the Multi-Green Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Norton, and today we'll be speaking with David Dworkin, former Senior Housing Policy Advisor at the U.S. Treasury and current President and CEO of the National Housing Conference. During our time together in Washington, D.C., we discussed fiscal, policy, and zoning initiatives, the Build Back Better movement, and how better incentives are needed to stem the high housing prices. Enjoy our conversation. David Dworkin, it's great to be with you here today. Please tell us a little bit about what you're doing here in the city of Washington, D.C. Well, thank you. Nice to be here, Andy. I run the National Housing Conference, and we are the oldest and largest housing coalition in America. Um, I like to say we were founded in 1931, and Eleanor Roosevelt had our first fundraiser. You were telling me about a special letter you received. Well, we have two letters in our lobby that I think are pretty cool. One is the letter from Franklin Roosevelt to um, uh, Senator Wagner from New York, who wrote the 37 Housing Act, which is really the beginning of the modern mortgage finance system and housing infrastructure. And it says, when I get back from Warm Springs, let's get together and talk about affordable housing. And at the bottom is a note um, to Eleanor Roosevelt saying, this is following up on our founder's request. And then in 1941, um, when he got back from uh, the Casablanca summit, he sent an unsolicited letter to us, basically saying how appreciative he was that we were the pioneers of the affordable housing movement and reminiscing about an event he did with us in Pittsburgh the year before. And I was really curious, why was he sending this, this letter? There was nothing in the file that suggested, or in the letter that suggested we had asked for it. And what I found out was that his stress level was managed by his staff with personal correspondence. Mm. And so I had this vision of him coming back from Casablanca, which was, you know, he was under enormous pressure to invade Europe by, from Stalin and from Churchill, and we were not ready. And um, I could see, you know, one of his aides saying, you know, we should remember that great event we did in Pittsburgh. We should write to, you know, uh, Mary Simkovich and talk about the importance of winning the peace, not just the war. And that, um, you know, is very much a part of our role um, was uh, bringing people together in a way that is often unexpected. I think of us as the unlikely coalition. Um, Mary understood that people were not listening to her talking about affordable housing, but when she partnered with labor unions and home builders, it could be about jobs and housing, and that had a lot of um, resonance. And so throughout our history, um, we've built these unlikely coalitions across the political spectrum. Um, because for us, you know, Washington's very partisan, but housing is our party. So tell us what type of housing um, research or advocacy specifically do you guys do? So it's a broad range. Um, we, you know, in, earlier in history, we advocated for the construction of most of the public housing that's in this country. Um, today, our focus is on um, housing production across the spectrum, income spectrum. We just don't have enough housing. Uh, and as a result of this crisis in housing supply, housing prices have been going up across the board for low income people, for middle income people. Um, I think. Everybody knows uh, someone who has uh, a, a millennial, has a great job, making good money, still can't afford their own place mm -hmm. living at home. And so we are very focused on housing production right now, as well as increasing home ownership, particularly among people of color who have really been um, significantly left out of the American dream. What is the, you know, need and, and the resources that are still required to address this crisis? One of them is money. Um, w there is a gap between the um, economics of providing in affordable housing, housing that's affordable to most Americans, and higher end housing. Uh, and as you know, the fixed costs are significant. You have to, you know, drive profits somehow. Um, you're going to end up raising prices or making higher end housing um, as a result, because if you're making more affordable housing, um, you're basically paying for that. 
um, since your fixed costs are often the same, especially around land. And we need incentives, um, better incentives, to build affordable housing. The low-income housing tax credit is the most effective of incentive that we have. It's been incredibly successful and built millions of units of affordable housing through a private-public partnership, which has worked really well. Um, we need more uh, allocation for the low-income housing tax credit. We have a new program that is in the Build Back Better Act that will help address the affordability gap um, and the appraisal gap, which is really important. We have a lot of housing that isn't too expensive, it's too cheap, um, because after you've repaired it or built it, you're still not at the appraisal line. And so this appraisal gap, this tax credit helps address that for home ownership. Uh, and down payment assistance is really important for first generation home buyers, particularly people of color, because they don't have the benefit of multi-generational home ownership, which, which most of us have enjoyed. Um, you know, I got down payment assistance, I got it from my father. And I call that the da Daddy Down Payment Assistance Program. And not everybody gets it, but a lot of us have, and that is a result of intergenerational wealth, often built by multi-generational home ownership. And um, that was denied people of color. So when I think about down payment assistance, I'm not thinking about it as a program that is taking something away from us. It's really about making something available to people who were left out um, when the rest of us got it. And uh, programs like the VA loan and FHA um, were excluded um, from people who weren't white uh, up until the 60s. You mentioned money and allocation into this space. It makes me think of private activity bonds, tax exempt financing. Is there a way to increase that volume coming into these housing corporations or any other program that would be for affordable, subsidized, or more attainable housing? Yes, I think that's a great question. Private activity bonds are an important part of how we support housing through what are referred to here in Washington as tax expenditures. It's different than direct appropriations. The low-income housing tax credit is one of those. Private activity bonds are another. They're very important ways to create incentives to build affordable housing. They're also easily misunderstood because private activity bonds are also used for things like stadiums. And um, we had a situation during the um, tax reform bill a few years ago where um, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee really conflated the two. And we ended up having to fight a big battle to protect private activity bonds for housing um, because they're not just for stadiums. They um, built a lot of housing around the country um, that's really badly needed and have a true um, public purpose. Well, what other policies or resources could we create to get more money into this space? I think that um, another opportunity we have um, to create more affordable housing and better environments for affordable housing um, is the Opportunity Zone Program, which um, was uh, created I think largely to create jobs, which it does a pretty good job of. We're seeing more and more use of that today. Not as good on um, creating residential um, uh, building and because of the way it's structured, so we can improve that. I think we can also improve the way we assess uh, and track its success. That's incredibly important. And um, the other is uh, incenting zoning reforms throughout the country because local regulations, particularly zoning and um, what they call impact fees, are um, huge disincentives um, to create housing that's more affordable. Not just low-income housing, but middle-income housing as well. In many parts of California, as I'm sure you know, you can pay $100,000 per unit as an impact fee just to be able to stick a shovel in the ground. And when you add that to the cost of a single unit of housing, you've really changed the dynamic. If it's subsidized housing, you're going to end up needing more subsidy, which means there's going to be less to go around. That's a waste of federal funding. At the same time, if you're building market rate housing, you have to raise your price because that money isn't coming from anywhere else. Multi-green and NHC has almost identical goals. We are trying to help 
address the affordable and attainable housing issues. Some would say there's a housing crisis, some may not. What is your opinion? Well, there's no question there's a housing crisis, but each housing crisis is a little different. You know, in 2006 and seven and eight, and then the crash that occurred, we had a crisis of demand, artificial demand, that was being caused by um, irresponsible lending. What we have today is very different. We have housing price increases um, that is not a bubble because it is driven by a lack of supply. I like to say the law of supply and demand is never repealed. And as a result of that, housing prices are un unusually inflated, um, but it's not because of a bubble. As we build more housing, housing price appreciation will flatten out and um, become more affordable over time, but we have got to deal with the fact that we're just not building enough housing. We're here in Washington, D.C. What work is happening behind the scenes with policies that I or others just might not know about? Well, right now, you know, the big housing issue in Washington is part of the Build Back Better legislation that um, President Biden has been pushing in Congress. We have a very narrowly divided Congress. I think this legislation would have had strong bipartisan support had it not been for the just really bitter divides that we've seen in our national politics. No Republicans are going to support a Democratic bill and vice versa mm. on almost everything. There are elements of the bill that have bipartisan co-sponsorship but aren't going to get the support because you're just not allowed to do that right now. Um, this isn't unusual in our the broad span of American history, but it certainly in my lifetime is the worst it's ever been. This legislation the Build Back Better Act includes 170 plus billion dollars in housing funding that will really have, make a significant impact on the availability of affordable housing throughout this country. It is more money than was appropriated, even adjusted for inflation, than the Great Society and the New Deal combined. Mm. So. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to make a huge impact on housing. And uh, I think we'll also open up the opportunity for us to focus our attention then on making sure that the regulations for these, this funding um, is written and reformed to ensure that it ha has its maximum impact. So it's a very exciting time here in Washington for housers. We're very hopeful this legislation gets passed there were tax provisions that many in industry were worried about, and much of that has been repaired through the negotiation process. So I also think that on the pay-for side, which we call the piece of how you're going to pay for it, as opposed to putting it on the national credit card, um, it's, it's improved a lot. That's wonderful news. In that Build Back Better legislation, there's also a lot of mention to green technologies at Multigreen, we're trying to incorporate those innovations into housing. Is NHC doing anything to address the sustainability of housing? Yes, I think it's a critical element of how we build housing in the future. Housing is not a major driver of um, global warming, but it is absolutely a component. And it's um, important that we address these issues across the board. Um, you know, there are ways that um, many advocates uh, in the environmental movement are suggesting um, for dealing with global warming that uh, deal with very hard choices around industries and jobs. Dealing with global warming in the housing space is not a hard choice. It's about building homes that are going to have a lower carbon footprint. They're going to be less expensive to live in because your energy costs are going to be lower. I think we have seen energy costs go up quite a bit recently. We're probably going to continue to see that. And so it's a win-win when we invest in a green housing. And supply chain issues. Right now, many of our supplies are off the west coast of Long Beach and that port. Is there any policies that we can initiate to correct that going forward? 
Well, if anybody isn't aware of what's going on <laughs> in the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles, they can just Google that and they will see aerial photographs that are really shocking of dozens of um, container ships lined up. And what they don't see are all the issues around trucking and delivery, local delivery, the supply chain. It's not broken, but it's pretty bruised. And this is one of the unexpected impacts of um, the pandemic that over time will repair itself, but um, we have got to focus on how we're gonna get that adjusted very quickly. It's driving housing prices, it's one of the factors. Lumber costs are driving housing prices as well, as you know, and um, recently um, the administration doubled the tariffs on Canadian softwood timber. That's just not okay. And I've been at White House where, you know, we have the White House right over our shoulder here. And um, I participated in meetings with home builders and labor unions and, um, and, and timber suppliers to talk about the supply chain crisis in housing. The administration says they're committed, but this tariff um, situation is really unfortunate and not helpful. We need to um, negotiate an agreement around timber with Canada. We also need to deal with our capacity here in this country and increase that. Um, lumber prices are just way too high and it's a huge driver of housing costs as well. In this conversation alone, we've discussed two crises, the housing supply crisis. We've discussed the energy crisis of sustainability. We've discussed um, the crisis of money getting into this industry. And now we're in a health pandemic crisis. Is this industry of housing just getting hammered right now more than any other? Or is this just, can every industry say that this is pretty out of balance? Well, I mean, I think it's, um, if you're a houser, you can definitely be grateful you're not in the restaurant business. <laughs> so I think the pandemic has had uneven impact, but it has definitely had impact across a wide range of industries. Housing is just one of them. Our focus is on fixing this problem, but you know, the last time we had a pandemic in this country was 1918. That's over a hundred years ago. So we really are dealing with um, not just a once in a generation crisis, but a once in multi-generation crisis. And my, you know, it wasn't a surprise to my brother. My brother's an epidemiologist. He's been studying this his whole life. I think the surprise for him is that it took over 100 years for us to have another mm -hmm. pandemic. But we're in it now, and um, things like this will definitely show you wherever you have systemic weaknesses that have to be addressed, because it's going to shake them all loose. Some of NIHC's policies discuss housing intersections. What does that mean to you? I think, you know, it's important to think about housing as a continuum. It is more than just housing for very low income people. It's more than just people who are at the 80% of the area median income or for um, uh, mixed use housing or for high end housing. If we're not building enough housing for home ownership, we are going to have fewer homeowners and more renters. That means with more renters, you have increased demand and you're gonna have higher rents. The higher the rents go, the more you're gonna squeeze people into smaller units and people at the bottom are gonna end up homeless. We have an unusual increase in economic homelessness. And you know, there are really, if you're gonna put them in two buckets, there's um, economic homelessness and there's chronic homelessness. And in chronic homelessness, we're dealing with people who have severe mental issues, they have, um, uh, they may have alcoholism or drug abuse or um, uh, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, and that is really hard to deal with. And it requires a lot of intense effort to help people who are suffering from those kinds of um, situations. But what we've seen recently is a huge increase in economic homelessness, which is completely avoidable. We just don't have enough housing for folks. and. Um, you know, as I'm sure you've seen in Los Angeles, there are 10 cities where every morning people get up, they wash up in a local restroom and they go to work every day. And then they go back to a tent living in the street. 
that's just not okay for this country. And that is not about people who don't want to work or don't want to contribute to society or can't. Um, this is about people who've really been left behind. Um, and we have to make systemic improvements if we're going to deal with systemic failures. You've been in this industry, in this city for a very long time. We can look back 10, 20, or even 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Have there been significant changes and wins in this sector? Yeah, I think there have been. Um, as a result of the SNL crisis in the 80s, we really addressed the issue of how we manage interest rate risk. And this was done in the 92 um, Housing Act. It was also addressed in changes that the industry made in how we securitize mortgages and how we move the interest rate risk into really a separate category that uh, can be managed. Um, it's, it's complicated and difficult, and um, we've done a really good job managing interest rate risk. I think that that created a lot of stability, and um, but some of the errors in how that was done uh, ultimately led to um, the housing crisis in 2008. And that was um, really, um, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, lenders were increasingly forced to compete against each other for market share that was driven by the lowest common denominator in the industry. So the worst lenders were driving market share by offering products that people could not afford. And other lenders felt like they were forced to follow suit to maintain their market share. This was also true of, on the investment side, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who were also competing against the subprime market that was taking um, market share away from them and from each other. And bad lenders were able to capitalize on that. We ended up with this crash, a housing bubble that was driven by demand. As a result of that, we created the Dodd-Frank Act, which addressed the 2008 crisis. It's interesting, when President Trump ran for office, eliminating Dodd-Frank was one of his campaign platforms. And I was at the Treasury Department at the time, and Secretary Mnuchin, his Treasury Secretary, came in and said, you know, we need to deal with this. We're going we're gonna to meet with people all across the industry, and they're going to tell us how to, the worst parts of Dodd-Frank and how we're going to take this thing apart. Well, we had dozens of meetings with people all over the industry, and I can tell you that nobody came in and said, eliminate Dodd-Frank. What we heard from banks in particular was, hey, listen, here's a few things we hate. These are a problem, but for God's sakes, don't touch that because I don't want to have to compete against the lowest common denominator of my industry anymore. And at the end of the four years of the Trump administration, 80% of Dodd-Frank is still there. And I think that's a pretty good testament to the legislation to say that when the opposite party comes in with a, what they believe is a mandate to unravel a piece of legislation and they ultimately decide to leave 80% of it intact, um, you probably got some things right. If you had your druthers and you could do anything you want here in Washington, D.C. to improve this industry, to suggest a policy, um, your perspective, you know, is very worthwhile to listen to. You've been at it longer than anyone I know. What would you want to do? What could you do? Building housing that's affordable to all Americans across the income spectrum really is the biggest thing because ultimately government is going to help the market. Um, we don't have a pure um, uh, capitalist system that um, uh, where capital flows down the hill um, through its most, you know, like water um, to its most, um, uh, you know, effective or efficient, whatever it is, path that, you know, that works fine if you're talking about a pretend mountain. But when you have a real mountain and a village at the bottom of it, you know, a couple of dams or a um, levee or, you know, um, are, are probably going to be in order to make sure the water doesn't naturally flow down to wipe out the village. The regulations are like that. You want to have the right mix. You don't want to have so much because you do want to harness the power of the market. And the way to do that is to help address the impediments to, say, creating housing that is going to then make um, uh, 
make it more available to more people. And we have a problem with that now. We know what that looks like in our past. We've had most of the last hundred years, we've been able to build the housing we need. We've got problems doing that right now. And I think that's the most important thing to resolve. Um, government policy is going to help that. In some cases, like with regulations, we need to address those in ways that we get government out of the way um, responsibly. Um, there are a lot of regulations that are really important. I think most are that are in place today. Some of them do a lot of damage, and you end up cr creating a scenario where nine people can't get a home so one person doesn't get hurt. And I don't think that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we do need some regulatory reform, but mostly we need to create the incentives and remove the impediments to creating more housing for everybody. And on the flip side of that coin. That's quite an in, uh, endorsement for home builders, <laughs> um, but it just happens to be true. On the flip side of that coin, there's people like me in the industry or just, you know, the constituents that are voting uh, in these communities. What can we do to help advance these policies and support you in Washington? Well, you know, the National Housing Conference has a very broad group of members, but no one segment is more than 20 percent of our membership. That's really valuable. And the ones they listen to the most, frankly, are the ones who I like to say have mud on their boots. So for you, um, what's essential for us here in Washington is to help us understand what are the friction points for you? Where are we in the way and where do you need extra help and how to make the difference that you're clearly trying to make? I think that's the key because at the end of the day, um, it's about results. And if we're not getting the results, we're not going to have the impact we want and we're not doing our job. At the end of every podcast, we ask the participants to define what attainability means to them. And this is season one, and our theme is attainability. What does attainability mean to you? How would you define that? I think for me, attainability means um, being realistic. Uh, we want to be ambitious, uh, but we also want to um, work with the world we have. And we're one of the leaders of an effort to create 3 million net new black homeowners by 2030. We developed that number, that goal of 3 million by looking at the market and saying, what's the maximum we could achieve and how much more could we achieve if we made changes that we know are necessary? And that's how we drove the 3 million number. If we don't make the changes that are necessary, we cannot hit that 3 million number by the end of 2030. But if we do, we can reach it. And that'll drive the black home ownership rate from the low 40s, where it's been since when housing discrimination was legal in 1968, to the mid 50s, which is not parity, but it is a huge increase and will help us establish a foundation that we can then close the gap from. So I think attainability is about being realistic and ambitious. It's a tremendous goal. Thank you for sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Join us as we build 40,000 attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily homes by 2030. And if you like the content you're hearing, hit the subscribe button. Follow us at Think Multigreen and sign up to learn more at www.multi.green.